I've got this area scuffed up here where we put in this patch of wood. I'm going to try this lacquer sanding sealer. Just paint it on this general area. Wow, that looks pretty good. <laughs> it almost made that go completely away already. Just going to coat this whole area here and see if we can uh, blend it in where it doesn't look so beat up because it's got cracks and uh, the patch we put in is there. We'll let that sit and dry for an hour or so before we do any more to it because uh, the black dye ran out on the white here and I'm going to have to touch that up with the amber again and some different things. But anyway, we're going to have to uh, clean it up some and then try to buff that and blend it in. I can see I'm going to need to touch up a little more dark in this area in here. But it's, you know, it's starting to, starting to look better already. Well, as you go through these processes, sometimes you find that maybe you're close, but you haven't hit the nail on the head. And that's kind of the way this is. I like the color. I think the color that we changed this to is just real good. But unfortunately, it also shows up every flaw in the binding. Where, like, if you put clear on there, you would never see this. But because we put this color on here, it shows up every scratch, every scrape mark in the binding. So I'm I'm going to sand it all perfectly smooth and do the process again just because it just doesn't look as good as it could look. It's a lot more work, but it'll be worth it in the long run. So I'm not going to bore you to tears with me sanding all this off. I just wanted to show you that this is the process here. Like, see, here's a scrape, a scratch that's in there. It's not very deep, but it shows up because of the staining. And, uh, you know, we just have to clean that off sand it off. You can see it's about gone already. That one was a little deeper than some of them, but, but not bad. Pretty much gone right there. It's gone. So, then anyway, we just have to do that all over, and uh, and then we'll restain it again, and it should be slick and smooth and the right color, and it shouldn't show up all the little marks then. In an effort to keep the video shorter, I'll just tell you what I did. Um, I went around all the binding. Take a look down here. I went around all this binding with a paintbrush and I used this shellac. That turned it uh, just about the same color. It was very similar. But it showed up a lot of flaws in the binding, scratch marks, things. So I sanded it all back down. And also the brush marks and everything. Because this stuff dries really fast. So what I decided to do then is to try to spray it with airbrush. And so I've got everything taped off. Probably more overkill on the tape off than I needed to go, but it wasn't that hard to do more overkill than it was to do less. So anyway, got it all taped off and I've got the uh, shellac in here already and I'm going to uh, use my little airbrush. We're going to step outside and see what works. I've got the shellac thinned down a little bit with uh, denatured alcohol. So let's go see how this works. The camera's not cooperating very well, but uh, we're outside the shop here, and I'm spraying on this uh, shellac. It's bubbling a little bit, not going on smoothest. Never sprayed shellac before, so this is a first for me. Wow, it's hard to tell the difference from one to the other. Other than the little bit of bubbling that I'm getting on here, it's, it's not going on as smooth as I was hoping. May have to sand it and do it again. That looks that looks really good to me. <laughs> to my eye, that's almost identical. Other than, the, like I said, there's a little bit of roughness bubbling going on. We're gonna let that dry about 15 minutes or so. Well, actually, I gotta put it sprayed along the neck up here too. I'm not worried about getting it on the fretboard because the fretboard's all gotta be scraped anyway. Wow, way better than I thought it was gonna look in terms of color. So let's let that dry a little bit. I'm gonna do a little bit of light sanding where it's got the rough bubbly stuff and then we'll try it again. Well, we're out here for coat number two. Let's see if it goes on any better. Oh, at the cross in the road and the tanks in the trucks. Well, I gotta be honest, it's going on good in some places and not so good in other places. And it doesn't seem to let you sand off some of it. It just doesn't work. It doesn't blend. But on the other hand, it kind of looks like an old patina, the way it's looking. So I don't know. I may call it good enough because it's it's actually looking pretty good even though it's not going on smooth. I'll have to show you that up close later. Well, we're in pretty good shape here. I kind of like the way the binding matches. It's not perfect. This binding might be a little darker. It's a little bit uh, shadowy. You know, it gets dark in places, light in places. Uh, but this does too, um, you know, so I don't know, it's, it, you know, it looks 
period to me. I mean, it really does. So I'm pretty happy with it. I may uh, just take some sandpaper and go around it in places and lighten it up a little bit in a place or two just to kind of even make it look a little bit more like the other binding. But for right now, I'm going to just let that set. I think we're, we're good with that for the moment. What I'm going to work on right now is these two big cracks and uh, you can see them there and I'd like to make them disappear a little bit more. I'm not expecting them to completely go away. This one here has got a little bit of a ledge to it. Actually, probably this one does too. We'll just do the best we can with them. Try to make them go away a little bit and try to blend them in a little bit. We're going to start just by putting a little bit of CA glue to fill in the crack a little bit more. Looks pretty good. Go ahead and fill in this side too. Just letting that set for a little while there and see if I can wipe off where I've got a little bit of a run out. Just a little spot or two. Not much. Just kind of let that sit there and soak for a little while. Once I can tell it's starting to set up a little bit, I typically spritz it with that hardener to make it dry faster so I can continue working. This is another one of these deals where it's not flat at all, so there's no way we're going to be able to use a razor blade and tape. It's looking pretty good. May have to go over it again. It looks like it's sinking in a little bit. I think I will go over it again on this side especially. You know, that put more on there than I wanted, I can tell you for sure. I did wipe it off first, but it still ran more in there than I was hoping for. Try to soak up some of that without smearing it. Not too bad, not too bad. It's pretty good. That's almost level there now. Call that good for the moment. Back on this side and I think we're going to need some more here on this little crack right here that we could touch up also maybe to help that a little bit. There's a couple of pretty good deep dings right here that I'll just fill while I'm here. All right, we're going to let that dry on its own. Now here's a real deep ding right here, but this needs to be colored. It's uh, That's from something on a tailpiece coming down and hitting it there. I'm just going to go ahead and fill this deep one with uh, some wood filler because uh, it's a really deep hole and then we'll stain that to match and then we'll use the CA on top of that to seal it and, and hold it in place. Yeah, that hole went down in there probably close to an eighth of an inch. It's pretty deep. Or I'd say at least a sixteenth. Pretty deep. Looks like this dried in and uh, gonna need a little more application here. Yeah, it looks better. It's looking pretty good. All right, we're gonna let that sit for a little while. Give that an hour maybe and let it get good and hard. Boy, you can hardly even feel it at all now. I think it's going to sand up pretty, pretty good. I'm going to start with 600 wet or dry soapy water and we'll see what it looks like. Yeah. It may be working, it may not. It, you can you can tell it a little bit, but it's really not too bad. It's almost blended in. You can tell it, especially if you get it in the right light, you can see it pretty easily, pretty clearly. But it's not too bad. It's better than the way it did look with that big crack there. Go up to 1500 and then maybe 2000 if we need it. That's pretty good, really. It's not too bad. That may be good enough. And we may want to buff it out then, you know, to buff the whole thing out to blend it all together. See if we can fix these two little, three little... And the tractor's on the flat car low Becomes a part of the soul and the heart of mine I'm not really sure how to tackle the whole top. It's... It needs something. <laughs> I don't know if I polish it or try to buff it on the buffing wheel or just wash it with soap and water. I'm not really sure what all I need to do to it. It's close, but it's just kind of beat up, you know. I know it can look better. The whole top needs something just to make bring it back to life and I'm not sure just what to do to it yet. Working on this back where I put this uh, finish over this busted up area and uh, just trying to blend it in a little bit. I have a feeling that I'm gonna have to maybe do more finishing on this because it's not blending all that well yet. It doesn't look like the new finish is blending in real well to the old finish. These cracks, you know, look like they need more fill. I may have to go back over this with the finish again in this area. Try to build it up just a little bit more. Maybe sand it a little bit more and then put some more finish on it. Yeah, gonna need some more work there. Well, I just spent another 10 or so minutes sanding this with 600. I put several more coats of uh, finish over this. It's a uh, 
lacquer sanding sealer and I honestly can't really see the patch of wood that I put in here I put it in right here now there are some little low divots in here in the finish that I can see but I don't see the actual patch I'm gonna go ahead and put some more finish on this to try to fill these little divots but uh, we're getting pretty darn close it's about as good as it could possibly be for as bad as it was so I'm pretty happy with that. The finish, I'm not sure it's going to blend real well. I'm, I'm not sure whether I want to just put regular that sanding sealer back on here anymore or maybe just go ahead and spray it with some uh, aerosol uh, lacquer. And I think maybe I'll just spray it with the lacquer, put a couple coats of that on there and, and call it finished. Uh, you know, it, if this area here is absolutely pristine perfect, it won't match the rest of it. So, you know, I don't know that I want to make it pristine perfect. You can, but I just keep putting coats on here, coats on here, sanding it off, sanding it off. So there is a point of diminishing return here that, you know, you can work yourself to death and you're not really getting much more for what you're doing. And so I think maybe a couple of coats of the gloss lacquer and we'll sand that down to, to finish and buff it out and I think we're done. There's been several more coats of lacquer put on this. Just going over it with 600 lightly. Just trying to level it out a little bit more. Probably not going to be perfect, but I think it'll certainly match the uh, rest of the instrument in terms of uh, the area that's been repaired compared to the other areas. It looks pretty good, just not absolutely perfect. And these uh, cracks that were through there now are pretty much gone, and that great big patch I put in there now is, you know, I know where it's at, but it's pretty much gone. I think we may just call that good, and we'll just buff that out now, and I think we're... I think we're good. The things that bother me on this guitar that I would like to improve are all these like belt buckle scratches and things like that but boy that's hard to fix that where you can't really tell it so I don't know if I'm going to do much with that or not. I may touch up some of the really bad spots with a little bit of dye that's similar colored but other than that I don't know that I'm going to do too much. It's really really hard to match a finish like this in so many places. I mean if you're just doing one spot it's not too bad but if you're doing all these places because every place is a slightly different color and you know it's just really difficult. Well once again I don't think I had the camera on but I've been going around touching up all these scarred areas with some uh, it's called light brown Phoebe's leather dye and you know it's not a perfect match by any stretch but but it it uh, tones them down like where they were really white, makes them not stand out so much. And now I've done most of the brown areas in this area here, so that looks a lot better in my eye. Now I'm going to take some darker black and just go around and touch up these scars that are in the black areas. You can see quite a few scars, and I think that, you know, it'll make it look a little better. Of a boy who's raised by the railroad line. I think we're going to call that good enough. Um, it's not perfect, but we've got one more treatment to do to this. It's called the Miracle Finish Restorer, and I'll show you that. All right, so you can see the areas that are messed up down in here. This is the Miracle Finish Restorer. It really does make the finish look a lot better. It doesn't really do anything, to be honest with you. It just kind of makes the scratches blend in a little bit. It doesn't restore anything <laughs> it's just linseed oil that's all it is boiled linseed oil on these old finishes I use it a lot to uh, blend in the cracks it just kind of makes the cracks blend back to the finish it uh, just makes it look better I mean I don't know how to say it it just makes it look better and it also you know puts somewhat of a, a coating pieces of wood or the bare patches of wood it just makes it look much nicer and I wipe it on and then I let it you know set for a few minutes and then we just basically buff it dry and it just looks so much better it looks so much more uniform now I think you can see that it just looks a lot nicer now granted it's still shiny once you get it all buffed off dried out it dulls down a little bit but it just looks better than it did before you did it. That's all I can tell you. 
I wouldn't necessarily use that on a brand new finish, but these really old, dried out, cracked up finishes with a lot of chips, it's perfect. Like old violins, things like that. That you know. Now, when I say, you know, I wouldn't use it on a, I wouldn't use it on a priceless antique type instrument necessarily. But you know, these instruments that have just been beat around, and you're just trying to make them look better and, and everything, then it's a perfect way to handle that. So it looks better. Now we'll just kind of do the same thing to the back here. It just it dulls down the sh uh, the shininess of the scratches and things. It just makes the scratches blend away a lot better. And now we'll do the sides. I think that's going to complete the restoration part of the job on this instrument. Well, that completes the majority of the restoration work on this guitar. And, uh, you know, compared to the way it came in, it's starting to look like a pretty decent, well, fairly well cared for old guitar. It's still pinged all the heck everywhere, but uh, overall it's pretty decent. You know, no binding on it whatsoever except for the back when it got here. And, uh, well, the, that one little piece on the end of the peg head. But, you know, you can see that the binding matches pretty well in terms of the color. And uh, it just, you know, I'm pretty happy with the way it turned out. It's, it's kind of the look I was going for, and I think we've got it there. Now, we're going to start the setup process and get this thing moving out of the shop. Actually, the frets feel pretty level on there. I don't feel any high spots. So we should be good to go here for a setup pretty quickly. This has got the small frets on it, which I like. Something I didn't realize till just now is that this many frets are small and the rest of the frets are large. And I say large, these are just the standard medium guitar frets. These are like mandolin frets. I hate to replace them now because I got the binding on here and the binding is, is, is filed to the end of the frets. I don't think it's gonna make a lot of difference because the frets are pretty level. These have been filed down enough to match these. I wish I had noticed that before though, before I did all the binding and all that work. Didn't really notice it until I started putting this fret file on here and it doesn't fit these big, big fret. This narrow fret file fits these fine. Hmm, and these are mandolin fret wire, which is kind of small. I, you know, I like this size here on a guitar, which is the medium. So I guess I'm gonna go ahead and pull these frets out and replace them. Doggone the luck anyway. I pulled this one out without much consequence. I didn't wet this down or anything. I don't think wetting it down would help me at this point. There's a lot of overspray from lacquer when I was cleaning this up. So I don't think the water would get in there anyway. I'm not worried about the overspray because we're gonna scrape that all flat and level anyway, but I'm just gonna pull them. They seem to be pulling pretty good, pretty clean. These small wires, these small mandolin wires probably weren't tight in the groove to begin with. They're pulling out pretty clean. Sometimes you can't win for losing. Yeah, that one chipped a little bit there. I'm gonna have to fix that. Pretty good chip right there. I'm just gonna go ahead and pull the rest of them and then fix any chips all at once. Yeah, they came out pretty clean. Just one exception right here. We got one little chip that we can fix. Got this one little chip lifted up right there. Got a new bottle of super glue or CA glue. We got the glue in there and I'll use my little tool, push it down in place, wipe off the extra CA glue. I can't even see that at all. It just went back together perfectly. That's not going to be noticeable at all, even though it was a very large chip. Perfect. Now that it's set there for a couple seconds, I'm going to spray it because I want to keep moving. Okay, we got all the frets out of there. Next thing I'm going to do is clean the fret slot. And I've got my little tool here that I use to clean out these slots. And you can see there's a lot of junk down in there. Man, more than I would have expected. You want to make sure you start at opposite ends because you'll, you can, if you keep pushing, you'll push the binding right off the side of the neck. This has a little hook on it so it, I can stick it in like this and pull it away. And as I'm pulling it away, I can turn it over and get all the gook out of there. Well, I just created another little tiny chip right there, so got to fix that too. Now we'll just use this little tool to push it down in there really good. Once again, you'll never see it. Those old brittle fretboards, they're hard to work around without chipping them a little bit someplace. Okay, now I'm going to have to file off the little nub of binding right there next to each fret, unfortunately. Probably should have done that before I cleaned out the slots too. Oh well, sometimes you just don't do things in the right order. If I file it that direction instead, it won't get the 
won't fill the slot up. Okay, so now we gotta get us some fret wire made. Have my fret wire bender, and I remade these wheels on the bottom and put grooves in them so that uh, the fret wire would have a track to roll in. Even though this is not really, I mean, it's an arch fretboard, don't get me wrong, but it's not a real heavy arch. But it's good to have a little extra arch in your fret wire because it makes it adhere down to the fretboard better. As you can see, that's curling it up and we just run it through there a couple of times, tighten it down a little bit, run it through again, turn it this way where you can see what's going on. And those grooves in the pulley help keep the fret wire perfectly centered that way. Tighten it down a little more, a little more bend, a little more curve than the fretboard has is is desirable in my opinion tighten it down a little bit more and run it through one more time maybe even a little more okay actually that match is pretty close wouldn't have hurt if wouldn't hurt if it was just a little more bent i'll go ahead and bend it just a little bit more it won't hurt nothing there you go that's a little more bowed than the uh, fretboard is but not much more and that makes it uh, better for driving down in it gets the ends to stick down in there better the way i do this it's not super scientific or anything i just lay the wire on there i've already cut the little tang out off off the end which will go over the binding. And then I just lay my cutters flat to the binding there on the other side, cut it off. Then I nip off the little tang, like so. So you can see that the tang has been nipped off on this end and on this end. And now that will drive in down between the binding and leave the ends of the fret wire sticking out over the binding to be trimmed close later. I see lots of people using a hammer directly driving it into the slot. Um, that works, you know, there's, like I always say, there's a million ways to do everything. My technique is to use a piece of aluminum, which is a little softer, obviously, than the brass. I just put, the, put that on there, tap it like so, and it drives it right down in the slot. And puts all of the pressure directly where it needs to go and you can look at it and tell that it's in there. You can also emphasize the ends really well because you can put it right on the end like that and bend and, and tilt it a little bit so that you hit right on the very end and, and drive the ends in. So that works really good. So to me that's better than tapping right directly on the fret wire. But like I said, there's more than one way to skin a cat, so you can do it however works for you. You may have to glue the ends on a couple of these, like this one here, the end doesn't seem to be staying down in there real well. But we can come back and super glue those if we have to. Well, there's an unintended consequence, and it does happen once in a while. That popped right out, that inlay. That's okay, we'll set it out of the way, and we'll fix that later. It's not a big deal. Just one more thing to do, though. It's kind of good, though, because if it was that loose that it popped out, it probably would have popped out on the guy sooner or later, and he'd have lost it or something. I've been using this same piece of aluminum for many, many years, and you can see there's just barely a groove in the bottom of it. You know, it's not much of a groove, considering how many years I've been using in this I would say probably 20 years at least on this same piece of aluminum so you can use a piece of aluminum a long time before you wear it out okay they're all in there take these little flush cutters here and, and cut the ends of them off as flush as I can if I can okay so they're pretty flush I'm going to just file the ends down a little bit probably don't really need to do that because I can do it with the uh, actual recrowning tool better probably but knocking off a little bit of the worst of it at about a 45 or so now if this doesn't look like it matches well I'll go ahead and replace the rest of the frets but I think it does look already like it's going to be fine so I don't see a problem I've got the hole cleaned out. I've cleaned off the back of the uh, pearl. I've test fitted it. It seems like it's going to fit just fine. Putting the CA glue in there. And, and we're just going to take this plastic handle and push it down in there good to get it as flush as possible. You can break this pearl, so you want to be careful. No point in adding additional issues to it. That feels really flush, actually. Flusher than I was expecting. Very, very good. As good as the others. So it's, it's very good. No problem at all. And now we will spritz it with this so we can keep moving. Okay, I think we're good. Now these new frets that we've got in here are going to be slightly higher than these others. Uh, not a lot higher though, I don't think. 
but I'm going to go ahead and level them just and recrown them. Um, and before I do that, even I'm there, I think there's an end or two that may need to have some super glue pressed into it. This one here specifically. So we're going to put a little super glue on this end of this fret right here and uh, press it in place. And now we'll just hold it in place and spritz it with this accelerator that looks fine I don't see it moving now the rest of them I think are okay and this one's moving a little bit I think that's gonna be fine looking at these other ends this one down here at the very end looks like it's just a hair loose so I'm gonna go ahead and do it too okay I think we're good go ahead and level these out a little bit uh, I will say these older frets are must be a different material they're much harder to file these frets file much easier not that big a deal they look good they do, they don't look like they're mismatched now they look fine so we're gonna go with that I don't think there's gonna be any problem with that at all and no point in replacing something and creating additional damage and costing the customer a bunch more money if you don't need to do it okay now I notice I don't have any side dots in this and I may go ahead and put side dots in this too. That may be another step we're gonna take here. Well, it's that time where we're ready to start setting this baby up, but uh, we've got the bridge. The original tail piece uh, came like this and it's broke, uh, obviously. And it used to fit right here. You know, you can see it went way down. Well, the replacement tail piece is very similarly made but this part doesn't go down. You know, it's it's nowhere near the same. It would really be cool if we had some way to attach this to this upper part. And I could do that. I'm pretty sure I could find a way to attach that. I could braise it or something that would work, but it would probably discolor it. Uh, you know, this is, I think nickel plated on this one and this is probably chrome plated. Regardless, either way it would make a mess and I don't know that I could make it look good after I reattached it. So with that knowledge I guess we're stuck with just using this the way it is and I, I really hate that. I wish I could you know replicate this look on this tailpiece. But the replacement tailpiece, I will say, is very heavy duty made. I like it. I think it's well made. I, uh, you know, so I'm I'm happy to use the the new tailpiece, except for the fact that it doesn't look the same down here. Oh well, that's just the cards you get dealt sometimes. Okay, the original tail pin used to go in here. This is, I believe, probably the original tail pin, and it had, you know, it's a big pin that would go in this big hole. Well, that hole just happens to line up with uh, this bottom hole uh, to attach this new tail piece. So we're gonna have to fill this hole. Matter of fact, we're gonna fill all the holes. I don't think any of the holes actually line up uh, to this new tail piece. So we'll fill everything before we attach this. The clips of the ladies and the pictures of the men and the engineers have. And the brakeman ways of the red caboose. It's a part of the past. Never quite turned loose. It's a part of the soul. tail piece is going to cover everything but uh, this one screw hole so you won't see any of that anyway it's just there so if I drill holes right next to it it won't tear out so I'm gonna get a lined up here make sure that we're lined up real good and then we're gonna drill these holes and screw this in I've got a straight edge yardstick taped to the fretboard down the center of the fretboard mostly by eye just kind of making sure it's in the center and then I'm lining this up to make sure it's in the center and it looks real good right where I've got it so I think I'm going to go with that and um, I think I'm going to just go ahead and put a small screw right in the dead center first and uh, that way I can you know manipulate it that's where the strap button is going to go so a small screw there won't hurt nothing just gonna mark it there and then put and drill it and put in a small screw got the one center screw in here holding it in place and now i'm just going to put the other screws in these are the screws that actually came with this um, tailpiece i think they're just 
overkill long crazy long no reason to make them that long there's just there's no added benefit to making them that long these on the other hand might be a hair short but i think th i'd rather go with the short ones i don't think there'll be any problem not much pull la uh, you know trying to pull the screw out because it's pulling against this it, you know this angle here is pulling against the back of the guitar anyway these were the original screws that were in the tailpiece so if they work for that one they'll probably work for this one okay so the only thing here now is just to take i'm going to take this one out and put in a regular strap button here well i got the uh, strap button on there uh once again forgot to turn the camera on but uh anyway it that is a long screw and that strap button along is in there tight enough that it'll keep this tailpiece on there all by itself let alone the other three screws i've decided to go with standard light gauge these are diodario j16s ej16s is what they call them nowadays I'm a boy who's by the railroad line of a boy who's brave. I've looked online and there's a lot of pictures of this in a lot of different configurations. Well, there's two different configurations, I guess I should say. Some put this on this side, some put this longer one on this side. My feeling is the longer one should go on the treble side. And the reason is that the uh, that shortens that treble string, which would be under a lot of stress if it was that long tuned up to pitch. So to me, it's much better for the treble to be shortened than the bass. I think the longer bass string will give it a bassier sound. The shorter treble strings, of course, will, I think, you know, make the treble just fine. I don't think it'll do too much to the treble, but I do think the bassier strings will even add a little bass by being longer. Well, I've run into my first problem. That one's kind of tight. Uh, serving on this one was a little wide for the slot, apparently, but it's working. By the railroad line. Well, she's starting to look like a guitar at least. And the action's not too bad so far. It's a little bit high maybe back here, but we'll see after we get her tuned up. It may drop some because the top might sag a little bit. Uh, I doubt it's gonna sag much though, but let's see how it looks after we get it up to pitch. So let's do a precision setup here. And if I, I've got the uh, plunger centered over the fret wire and you see it's right on zero. And if I press this wire down, then it goes 30, there's 10, 20, 30, about 32, 3 thousandths, about 32 or 3 thousandths. Let's just double check that, just, you know, to see that we're playing on a even deck here. Let's take out the feeler gauge. Here's 20 thousandths, and here's 12 thousandths, so that's 32 thousandths. That ought to be pretty darn close to what, what we've got there, if this thing is right. It's almost exactly right. It's just like perfect. You can't even you can't even move the string. It's just like exactly. So this thing is very very accurate. It's a little slow compared to just like you know if you just use that thin pick like I do, that's a really fast way of checking it. This is slower, but it's really accurate. Now the the advantage that I have with this is I can set this one say at eighteen thousandths and then set this one at seventeen thousand, sixteen, fifteen, fourteen, thirteen. You know I can just go right down the line if I want to. So let's, we're going to have to get this one down. It's quite high. Thirty three, thirty two thousandths is a long ways off from where I want it to be. Now for my quick checking, I am going to use this because it's just faster than to take this dial. So that's what we're going to do. The other thing about this is you have to have the string all the way up at pitch. Otherwise, the weight of that alone will push this down. So there is some disadvantages to using the bigger the gauge. But it is pretty cool. Still high. Now that looks like that's just about exactly 18 thousandths. Real close. Real close. Let's just see what this thing says. Now the trick of this is you got to get it just right. And you know this f fingerboard is really arched. It's got a lot of curve to it. So you got to get it on those two legs that are right over the straddle of the string. That's on 80 thousandths and that's close enough for, for measuring it here. So let's, uh, we got 10. 15, it's going to 15 is what it says, but let's double check that. It, I don't think I've got this adjusted perfectly. According to that, it's only uh, 13 thousandths, but I don't know, I don't feel, I feel like it's lying to me here. I probably don't have it up to pitch. That might be the problem. There, it's about 15 thousandths. Let's see if this is at pitch. That might be part of the problem. There you go, it's a 
up to pitch now. It's about 15 thousandths according to that. According to this, it might be, it might be that. It's real, it's, I would say it's really close to the 18 thousandths based on that, the way that feels. But anyway, it's, it's, it's real close and it's real good. Uh, the next string looks like it's probably close. It's not quite all the way there, but let's just check it, see what it says. It's about 25 or 26 thousandths, about 25 thousandths right now, which is about what I would say based on this. It's a little loose fit. You can see it moved just a tiny bit. And a tiny bit, you know, I'm talking like the width of a hair, which is about 5 thousandths. So I would say that's pretty good, pretty close. Let's go knock it down just a little bit. Won't take much to get 5 thousandths out of there or a little more. pick again I'd say it's real close it's still got a little bit of movement to it though see if we did anything at all pretty close to the way it was didn't get much out of it that time yeah that's moving about 18 thousandths there now actually it's less than that let me about 18 pretty close about 18 thousandths something like that which is about where I'd say it is with this yep it doesn't move at all it's right on the money all right let's see the next one it's got it's probably eight or ten thousandths too high I would think yeah it's quite a bit it's uh 35 thousandths it's moving it's moving right at 35 thousandths and I'd say that's probably about right because it's pretty high that looks right on the money there let's see yep right on 18 thousandths see there's it's on 50 there's 40 that's 10 and there's five more one two three it goes exactly to 18 thousandths and that's what it shows on this too with my little pick gauge here right on the money just got two more to go three more to go I guess it is still haven't done this one I don't think yeah that one's about 28 or 29 thousandths movement right there so we got to take some off of it too looks really close okay there's it's on 40 thousandths there and when we mash this down it, there's 10 goes about 16 thousandths we can live with that 16 thousandths that would be just about right two more i'm going to turn it around and face it the other way on these last two i'm pleased with how it fits across the strings really well and that was just a guess on my part i got to be perfectly honest with you it's a little awkward to hold it flat okay so let's put it on 80 thousandths there and it's going 20. it's moving 20 thousandths 21 thousandths about 21 thousandths is what it's moving that's not far off of the 18 that we that we're looking for us but we want a tight 18, so it'll be a little under 18 when we're done. Don't need to take off very much to get this one down, I don't think. Well, that's surprising. It's moving more than I thought it would. It's moving about 25 thousandths, which is more than it moved before, I think. Verify that. A sanity check here. Yep, it's higher than it was before, so it must be sitting on a little ledge inside this nut or something. There must be a problem there because it's actually higher than it was before. My guess is there's some kind of ledge in that nut and we're gonna make sure we don't have that. It's getting much closer now. I don't think it's quite far enough yet, but it's pretty close. Right at 20 thousandths now or 19, it's about 19. We're gonna take off just a little bit more. Yeah, all I needed was something to just make me a little more uh, anal here. That's all I needed. Yep, that's that's gotta be it. It's about 14, 15, it's about 15, thousands right at 15 thousands and that's good on that b and this e will take it down to about like that also maybe even a little bit closer than that possibly i didn't measure it first but i know it's high i'm not going to take it all the way up to pitch because i don't want to break it yeah i can put us put the pick under there without causing any vibration so it's obviously high it's about 12 thousands according to that maybe 14 thousands yeah, about 14,000, 13 thousandths. Anyway, that's just about where I want it. So that's real good. Let's just see how far off it is up here at the 12th fret now. I think it's high up here. It looks like it is. There's 115 and that's pretty high. Here's 120 and it's still high of that. Here's 130, it's still high of that. So it's pretty high. Or on this side, 120 is just about on the money. So it's pretty close on this side as far as 120 goes, right there, but it's quite high. So we need to drop this bridge down and we can drop it down. Now what happened when I dropped it earlier, 
it was hitting these frets. So it must tail up a little bit back here. Right now it's pretty good, but if we drop it down much, it's probably gonna hit. But we're gonna see what we can do here. See if we can go down. I'm gonna go down with the bass side first, if I can, and it don't have much adjustment left. And then we're gonna go down with the treble side a little bit. Looks to me like I see a crack in the in the bridge too. Doggone it. We got a little crack in the foot of the bridge right here and we'll have to fix that. See if we got anything out of that. Yeah, we might have got a tiny, tiny amount, but we didn't get much. Well, we're about 115 on the treble side. So we got to go quite a bit down in order to make this work. And the only problem with that is that we're out of adjustment here, really. The bridge is, is all the way bottomed out. I don't know if you can see that or not, but it's, it's all the way down. So the only thing I can do, literally, is either cut some off the bottom of the bridge, which I think it's a cut as much as it should be cut, or cut just a little bit off of the ends, kind of like a mandolin saddle, how it's notched out, and notch out just a little bit on these. And that's what I think I'll have to do. So let's give it a shot. And we might as well unstring it and fix this crack in the in the foot of the bridge right here too at the same time. I don't know if you can see the crack that's in there or not, but it goes all the way across here. It comes all the way up and up in here. Quite a long crack. So what I'm going to do is take the CA glue. It'll wick itself down in that crack really good. Yep, you can see it all the way through. So it's come all the way through there, and now I'm just going to hold it shut, and I'm going to spritz it with the uh, accelerator, and I'm going to spritz it on this side. That ought to fix that. Well, I didn't notch it very deep, but believe it or not, I actually notched that with my table saw because I wanted to keep it square to the bottom, and uh, that was the easiest way to do it because everything else is curved on this thing. Anyway, I uh, have quite a bit of a uh, thread sticking out here across the top, and I hate that because your hand hits on that. So I'm going to take that over to the grinder and take that down and get it below the wood level at least. We've got them both down in there now. I mean, I just don't think I can afford to take much more off of this bridge. Probably could still take a little bit off of the ends like I did here on the bottom side. I'm just going to check the uh, height now and see where we're at. If we're anywhere close to 100, we're going to say that's good because that's not that high for this style guitar. I would say, generally speaking, most guitars of this style have a fairly high action down the neck. Not all of them, but quite a few do. We'll tune it back up and see where we're at. Well, it's down to about 90 on, thousandths on this side and 115 thousandths on this side. This side is fine. See, it's dying here. There's a high fret on that string starts to hit here so I imagine it's this fret here we're gonna I'm gonna just take these two strings off do a little bit of working in this area here and, and get rid of that well after all of the work I've done on this off camera which you haven't seen which has been a ton let me tell you I've decided there's way too much underbow in this uh, way too much underbow there is a truss rod adjustment it looks like right here but it takes a special key the end of the rod is flattened so you would have to have something that would go and catch onto that flat and spin the flat. Um, it's not a screwdriver head. It's not a, you know, it's not any standard thing. So I'm going to have to make a tool to turn that and tighten it. I made this uh, bolt with an end on it uh, that fits over the end of that shaft. I'm putting this paper down here so I don't scratch that. I'm going to take this screwdriver and see if we can tighten it and see if it'll turn. I don't know if it's going to work doesn't feel like it. Feels like something's stuck. And it's already bending my tool. Yeah, I was afraid of that. Well, that is very tight. I can tell you that for sure. Uh, very tight. And I can tell you for sure it needs to be tight. Because this has got a lot of underbow. I would say... Golly, I'd say 50 thousandths underbow, maybe more than that. It's a lot of underbow. Let's see what we can... I mean, it's playable the way it is. I would just like to make it better. Here's a pick, and it'll... I think it'll slide under there. Well, not quite. It doesn't quite go under there. No, nope, that doesn't quite go under there, but it's very close to going under there. 
Let's see what will go under there. Here's here's that 32 thousandths that we had a while ago. Let's just see if that'll go under there. I bet it will. Yep, no problem at all. So right now, you know, without string tension, it's got 32 thousandths, and that's just about exactly right. It's just touching on those three frets, especially. There's these three middle frets, and right here it goes in pretty easy. A little tighter there, but here pretty easy. From about right here out, it's really got a lot of underbow. That's crazy amount. If, Like I said, if you can see it, you got too much, and I can see a lot of underbow in that. And there's no string. I don't even have the strings tight. Their strings are loose. Unless I can figure out how to tighten that without breaking it, and I'm afraid it's going to break since it, it, was, uh, it bent that no problem. So I don't know what I'm going to do now. Back up and punt. Here we go again. Well, here's more proof that no good deed goes unpunished. This little thing here... <laughs> at least an hour's worth of work. Not on this one specifically, but this is the third iteration. I tried a quarter inch bolt with a slot cut in it to reach in there and turn this weird truss rod thing. The truss rod thing has kind of like a regular screwdriver end on it. In other words, it looks kind of like that. It's a round shaft, but at the end it comes out kind of at a flat square blade, thicker blade. It fits this slot precisely. Then on this end, I put a regular screwdriver blade so that I have something to turn it with. And that's the first time I've tried fitting my screwdriver in there to see if it fits. So I, I'm glad it fits. This does fit the other end. I've already tested that. And I've got that as precise as I can make it to fit as tight as I can make it. I finished it by hand. The first iteration was a quarter inch bolt and I tried this and the quarter inch bolt, just regular standard bolt, was not strong enough steel to turn it. It just twisted those little flaps right off. The next iteration that I tried to make out of this, I found a very, very hard piece of steel and it was so hard that even my angle grinder wouldn't scratch it. I mean, literally after about a minute of grinding, I could feel a little scratch in it with my fingernail. That's how hard that piece of steel was. So that one went by the wayside. I couldn't do anything with that one. I think it was pure carbon or something. I really don't know what it was. Some kind of tooled something. This iteration is also tool steel. It's a drill rod. It's, you know, it's a high carbon type steel. But you can cut this on the metal lathe, fortunately, because I had to narrow it down here to get it into the fingerboard because there's not much space. That was the size of the original drill rod. And it, you know, it just was just that much too big to go under there. So I turned that end down, which was not easy to do with my little lightweight lathe. But but I, I annealed this first with my torch to soften it, and that helped some. Um, you know, it's just on and on. I mean, you just can't believe how hard it was to make this little tool. Now, will the big question is, will it have been all in vain, or will it work? Let's see. I have not tried it yet. I literally just finished making it. So here we go. Okay, as you see, I've got this piece of plastic down because something could slip. You've got all this extra stuff here and something could slip very easily so I have to get this under there and get it on the uh, end of that which that's not even easy to do it just barely fits and that's on there as tight as I can get it now here is the screwdriver going into that now I'm going to try to loosen it first because tightening is probably not a good idea to even see if if it will turn okay it did turn it looks like and 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 this at least was strong enough to turn it where the quarter inch bolt wasn't it's taken quite a bit of force to turn it i will tell you but i'm going to wiggle it back and forth a few times trying to make sure that the threads are opening up on this and i have a feeling they're going to be rusted from this point forward where it gets tight it just feels like it just hits a wall and stops i'm wondering what would happen if i turn this way loose don't know what the end of that looks like I'm turning it loose more and more I'm tempted to actually spray WD-40 down through there I don't think it's gonna hurt the wood if I did that I don't know it just feels like I hit a wall though when I tighten it and this trust me is like a ski ramp it is well I think I already showed a part of the video where I could stick 32 thousandths under here and it was just about snug but that's a lot 32 thousandths is crazy. 12 thousandths is plenty. So it's, you know, 20 thousandths too much underbow. And that's not, that's important because up here the frets are hitting the strings. When you get the action halfway decent here at the 12th fret, it's hitting here. And I'm doing my best to try to fix it, but some things just won't cooperate no matter what you do. 
and this might be one of them. All right, let's try tightening it again. There we go. At least this piece of steel seems strong enough to handle the job, I think. And it gets to that point where it gets tight and it just stops, literally stops. It's just like we've run out of threads or, you know, it's, it's rusted or something. Thing. Ah, man, if I twist harder, I'll twist it off. Wow, it just stops right there. And I know that didn't fix it because that's right where it was. Yep, it's still got a ski ramp. I can look down at it and see it. I don't know if the camera will let you see that or not. Let's try to let you see if you can see the ski ramp. It's, it's pretty bad. I don't know if that's showing up or not in the viewfinder. It's hard to tell. But anyway, it's bad. So, I don't know. I think we might be done. We may just have to live with it. I mean, the only other option is to take the whole fretboard off and, you know, work on the whole truss rod system and everything. And that's just, I think, more than we need to do for the problem. I'm trying. <sighs> I'm going to back it off again and see, you know, maybe a couple of ons and offs will send it past the spot, but I doubt it. What I'd like to do is put some back bow in this as I tighten this to see if that would help. That's a little bit extreme too, but I'm tempted to try that. But that's pretty hard to do too, to be honest. Pretty hard to do. I mean, I, I can set up a rig here and put back bow in it. I know how to do that, but it's still quite a lot of work. And you can potentially break something if you're not careful on an old dried out piece of wood, you know. Hmm. It just gets real tight right there. You can hear it crack you know, breaking loose again when I loosen it. It just hits something and stops. So either the rod has run out of threads or it's just so air rusted, which it, the end of this looks rusted. That's why I don't think it's, it may not be out of threads. I can actually see threads on the end of this, but then I don't know how, what it's going into. I don't know how it's made. I don't know that I'm not familiar with this design. I just hit the wall right there and it stops. Oh, that's it. Well, I have a tool for doing that now if I ever need it again. Probably never need it. That's the first time I've needed it in 35 years. We're done. It's We're just going to live with it. That's all you can do in a case like that. Putting the strings back on it, we're going to tune it back up. Um, I just wanted to point out that incidentally, I did not charge the customer for making that custom tool, even though I needed it only for this instrument. The reason is, my logic is, I don't feel like it's his fault because I don't have the right tool for the job but um you know i'm also pretty deep into this instrument already and uh the customer is going to have a pretty decent bill on this thing anyway so i'm just trying to help him out and trying to do the right thing there we're just about ready to see what she sounds like well friends we've got this epiphone triumph guitar back in pretty good shape i'd just call it tip top shape for the age and the way it came in the shop i'll tell you it came in rough <laughs> and uh no binding and uh it's uh, pretty much got everything looking pretty much original really i mean it's hard to tell the old binding from the new binding now just by looking at it. The, uh, you know, most of the scratches have been at least darkened or, light, you know, you know, fixed up where they don't show up so bad. Uh, that big chip of wood that was in the back back here that was out, uh, you know, great big chunk of wood missing. You can't even hardly tell it now. I mean, you can see the outline of it if you get it in the right light, but if you just, if you don't have it in the right light, you can't hardly tell it. So anyway, I'm pretty proud of the way this thing turned out. It's got a neat sound. It's the old bluesy kind of sound, you know, and I'm sure there was a lot of old blues played on this guitar. I don't remember the year on it. Uh, let me just give you the serial number again, just for the people that care about that kind of thing. It's a Triumph 141, looks like dash 72, but it for sure is a 14172. I think there's a dash there, if that's not just a spot. And uh, anyway, it's a uh, Pretty neat old guitar. You know, uh, YouTube likes to demonetize your videos if you do anything that's got, uh, that's people know about, okay? <laughs> so I'm gonna do you an original tune. I've got, I've written hundreds of songs to be honest with you. This is one that I think I've only played one time ever in my life. So I even had to get the word, print out the words <laughs> so to remember my own song and uh, you know I want you to, I'm gonna tell you right up front you have to put yourself back in the, about the 20s or the 30s somewhere in there to sing this song okay this this is not a modern era song <laughs> you know I had that in mind when I wrote it with that it was back in that era and uh, you know it's a sexist song okay? <laughs> 
<laughs> I'll just tell you right up front. It's it, there's there's no truth to this song in my life. I've just just wrote it for the fun of it. So, but at least YouTube can't grab the money on it. Okay, so they can't demonetize my video. So, um, hope you like it. It's just an old yodel song and kind of like the Jimmy Rogers uh, New Orleans blues tradition, if there is such a thing. So here we go. We'll we'll see what we can do with it. It's called The River of Tears Yodel. <laughs> well, I didn't know blue till I saw my baby last night. No, I didn't know blue till I saw my baby last night. She keeps me worried so I don't even know what's right. She says I'll cry you River tears. Well, my baby, she wants my money. She wants me to work hard too. My baby wants my money and she wants me to work hard too. She ain't got no time for me because she got a lot of shopping to do. She says, I'll cry you, River tears. I don't know why my baby thinks she has to treat me this way No, I don't know why my baby always thinks she has to treat me this way Well, I'm nice to her, but I never know what to say She says, I'll cry in a river Well, if my baby wasn't pretty, I'd probably just leave her behind. No, if my baby wasn't pretty, I'd just leave her behind. Oh, I know my baby's pretty, cause I'm always standing last in line. She says, I'll cry you a river tear. Hey, folks, I'm drowning in. A river tea. Well, like I said, it wasn't a great song or nothing, but at least you got to hear the guitar there, and YouTube can't do nothing about it. <laughs> Thanks for watching. Tell your friends. This was a struggle. Let me tell you, it was a struggle. Have a good one. Hello, everybody. This is Tony from Rosati Music. I'd like to take this time to thank Jerry Rosa for restoring my great-great-grandfather's 1938 Epiphone Triumph. What a great restoration this was. I had no expectations whatsoever. I took it to other people and they said, no way, it's not worth your time, nor is it worth your money. But I tell you, I gave it to Jerry. He put his magic hands on that guitar. I opened that case and I was blown away. So without further ado, let's hear how it sounds. Thank mm -hmm. you.